Ahoy hoy Terrans, Avi here, and today we're going to be exploring the subject of math history and the mathematics of math. Now you might be asking yourself, what does that title even mean? And are you just using that title as an excuse to use the word math three times in your headline? First of all, I'm highly offended by that presumption. And yes, but no, really, today more specifically, we're going to be delving into the ramifications of mingling mathematics and linguistics. Mathquistics, if you will. Or if you want, perhaps you prefer lingmatics. Either way, these are some of the things we're going to be exploring today. We will be talking about some of the ways mathematics is involved in the evolution of words and math history. So let's get right into it. The word math, first recorded in 1847, is of course derived from mathematics, which in itself comes from the ancient Greek mathema, which means that which is learned or what one gets to know. And surprisingly, at least to me, apparently up until around 1700, the word mathematics more commonly meant astrology, or sometimes astronomy, rather than the modern way we use the word today, which is all good and interesting. But that story has been told before. Today we embark on a more interesting lark, a more curious lark. You see, it's curious because it just so happens that the mathematics that gives this meaning gave another meaning, just one other meaning. You see, it's curious that the mathematics of numbers is the one we know today, when its brother is mowing your lawn. Oh yes, you thought this video was going to be reasonable and make sense, but no, for the purposes of this video, we are going to need to define two maths. Math number one, the common definition derived from mathematics, and math number two, old English subject of interest and topic for this video to be fully defined today. Yes, today we will be exploring math history and the mathematics of math. Part 1. History Now, in my opinion, before we can fully appreciate how there came to be two maths, I think we should familiarize ourselves with a highly abridged version of the underlying history. A long time ago, approximately during the 5th century AD, three tribes notably invaded Britain. These three tribes are known as the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. They crossed over the Northern Sea from what is now, respectively, Northwest Germany, Southern Denmark, and the Netherlands. As you might assume, along with provisions, they brought their languages. Now, up until then, the inhabitants of Britain mainly spoke a Celtic language. So as you might expect, what followed was a great mingled muddling of many mouths. That is to say, dialects. The resulting chaos, bewilderment, and confusion is known as English. Or rather, Old English at the time which I guess technically means that you could refer to what I'm speaking now as Young English? Which to me is entirely bemusing, but that's beside the point. Anyway, subsequently to that, as you might expect, many things happened. In 1066, William the Conqueror, the Duke of Normandy, invaded, introducing an old form of French. And later still, more languages were piled onto this Frankensteinian conglomerate mess of a language that I present in this video to you now. The result of all this is we have a language made of languages, which is important to know for our topic today because it partially explains why the resulting makeup of modern English is thus. Not that pie chart. There we go. I love a good pie chart. And of course, this is a simplification. A more accurate representation is that English is made of Old English, Danish, Norse, and French, and has been changed by Latin, Greek, Chinese, Hindi, Japanese, Dutch, and Spanish. But that's a little bit complex for this video. So back to the pie chart. Ah, this is nice. Anyway, as I was saying, this pie chart roughly shows the percentages that each language has had an impact on the composition of modern English. Roughly. And now we get down to it. As you can see, Latin and Germanic have both had fairly large influences. Latin is fairly straightforward, with many Latin and Greek words being incorporated around the time of the Renaissance. But just to clear up any confusion you may have around Germanic, Ancient Germanic is the predecessor to what would eventually become Old English, which I've mentioned before. So. We've got Latin and Old English, and with that, I do believe we can tell the story of two maths. Part two, how there came to be two maths. So funnily enough, with English being such a multitudinous mess as I've explained, is it really that surprising that sometimes two different composite languages of English, in our case Latin and Old English, developed separately the same mouth mashing? Sound. I would say no. No, definitely not. 
and with the non-fully onomatopoeic, when a word's sound is directly correlated to what it describes, the nature of English, is it really such a novelty that those words' meanings would be in no way specifically correlated? Yes, in my opinion, when you put it that way, it's not surprising at all that math number one is an American English shortening of the Latin-derived word mathematics, and math number two is simply a possible several thousand year older ancient Germanic word likely derived from a combination of an old high Germanic and old Saxon word meaning mow? Yes, really, as in mowing your lawn. But no matter how skeptical it may sound, that's just the truth as I was able to find it. In proper definition, it reads as follows, quote, a mowing, what is gathered from mowing, Old English mood, 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 and as you can see from the rest of this, there are many other words that I can't pronounce. Anyway, it continues, for to cut down grass or grain, obsolete except in figurative aftermath. Oh, and just in case that last bit piqued your attention, that's right, the math we've been investigating all this time is the math in aftermath. So, in the aftermath of this linguistic adventure, I present you with the following sentence. Quote, most crops are harvested once a year, but in the case of grass crop, farmers might return and perform a second mowing, or aftermath, after the initial harvest. But how did that come to me, the aftermath of an explosion? Well, you see, the term was later poetically adopted from the fresh grass that springs up after mowing, to the set of conditions that arise in the wake of an event, and finally came to connote solely the set of conditions that arise in the wake of a traumatic event. And the rest is history. And finally, part 2.9 repeating, conclusion. In the end, you might argue that this video was about linguistics and not math, but my retort to that would be, sometimes, are not the words that describe a thing as important as the thing they describe? That I leave up to you. If you take anything away from this video, I hope it would be thus. The next time someone says to you, math isn't interesting, simply respond, which one? And lead them down, in my opinion, a delightful path. Because I'd say, and by now I hope you agree, they're both fascinating. And as always, thanks for watching. Hello there. My name's Ave Rubin. I mean, Latin is fairly straightforward, with it being in the mathematics of math, 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 math